So congratulations, you show your very first film at Sundance as a director, and you sell it overnight. Yeah, which means I want very little sleep. What happened last night? Well, apparently, people wanted to buy it, and somebody bought it, so we're very happy. You know, so you didn't have to do the it. negotiation yourself? No, no, that was the great thing. I, I, and I purposefully said, look, I'm the director on this, I'm not the business person. But, of course, I tried to keep in the loop and just kind of listen in on the conversation a bit, which is fun. You know how that goes. That deal-making process is like It can be quite exciting. So you're already in bed with Lionsgate with another project. Well, yeah, on the production side, I've been working on a screenplay for uh, the producer David Heyman and uh, the production team there. It's a, it's a screenplay based on Reza Aslan's book called Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. And I've well, been having a blast working on it. Are you a Jesus expert? I am no Jesus expert whatsoever, but I am now, I could say, somebody who knows a lot about a lot of Jesus experts. I, I spent a year researching down all of Reza's research, which is incredible, and then continuing on. So, uh, so it's just been a, a dream here, really. Well, in a way, sometimes, you know, there's the old cliche that, you know, one window closes, which is, of course, the many years you spent running what was Good Machine, what became Focus Features, and uh, you left that, and, and it opened up, an, and, and being a Columbia film professor, which you still are, still, yeah, okay. and an author, which you still are, but uh, now you, you, you what, what was the thought process that went into saying, I'm now going to direct my movie? You know, the thought process really wasn't a thought process, it was more like a continuum of stumblings around trying to say, what's up, what can I do that's a little different, different muscles, exercise, and... Um, and just taking on crazy things. Even the Zealot screenplay was the result of just having breakfast with David, and he said, hey, I've got, I just stopped this crazy book, and I thought, that's just nuts enough to be interesting. And, of course, we know he's the producer of the Harry Potter uh, franchise yeah, I, and so on, I, I think and a him, man of class and distinction. I think of him as kind of the greatest living producer, maybe, so it's a little intimidating working for him, but he's so, great. he's so lovely, and the Lionsgate folks were great, very patient with me as I, as I kind of burrowed in, and so supportive, so somehow I've come full circle through acquisitions and the distribution side to join up all those, all those uh, uh, pieces of that puzzle. Well, it also opened up an enormous amount of time and energy for you to be, I mean, you've always been a screenwriter, you've worked closely with Ang Lee, but this gives you a chance to really be 100% creative all the way through the process. And it is true, the last couple of years at Focus, as the job became more corporatized uh, and kind of folded into the, uh, the, uh, the culture of the um, there, was a, there was less time for that, that creative side. Um, so that liberation, uh, albeit a little earlier than I thought I was going to take it, uh, is really a blessing. Now, Philip Roth, you've been an admirer a long time. When I knew that you were doing this, this and I, it's a story I never read, I never read this particular one, um, I thought, I thought, oh, cool, you know. James Seamus, Brady, intellectual. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna go into the Philip Roth universe. It's a perfect match. And what you fashioned was an elegant, old-fashioned, relatively straightforward narrative. Tell me why you didn't. In other words, you made this accessible. You made this a young person's story. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because that, um, at, towards the end of his writing career, we know that, that Philip has retired. He returned to a much more, I'd say, um, uh, fable-like style of writing and a much more meditative and limited approach that was not quite as meta-narrative. Right? It still is there. And if you look closely, the, both, the, both the novel and, of course, the film are seated throughout and structurally constructed in a way that there's nothing simple about the structure, it just we get a we, we get a feel of simplicity from it. That's so, that's example, hard to do. Well, we try. Thank you, because it, it was it was work. So the film, for example, has not one framing narrative; it has two, and it has multiple temporalities, and it has many moments that go by that the audience, I hope, doesn't notice, in which we're doing formally very strange things. Uh, for example, the fact that 
more or less every member of the cast more than once will turn to the camera and stare at us. Um, but it doesn't seem to break the story world, does it? No. But it does, I think, connect us in ways that are quite odd to this character. Well, you, you grab us at the very beginning with an older woman who we do not know. And then you grab us with uh, a cut to the Korean War, uh, where we don't really see who who we're following yeah, yeah. until later in the in the film. Yeah, and then we have all kinds of spoiler alerts. We up. we are trying not to reveal anything. <laughs> but it's funny that that they do become my version of that spoiler thing. So that the that what all the kind of complexities are actually embedded in the storytelling, and so you don't want to give those away, but they're. So they're, they're weirdly narrative, but they're quite specific, formal, odd things that I had really a blast putting together. Well, I think the screenplay is wonderful, but and you, that you know how to do very well. But when you became the director, did you get angry at the writer? Did you find that the writer had given you assignments that you did not want to execute? The, the, the writer is already so angry with the writer that uh, the director didn't have to worry about that. Um, you know, yes and no. I think that part of what the writing process for me has always been is to try to conceive something that is unfinished. Uh, not to write so tightly that uh, directing would simply be bad numbers. You know, oh, here's the instructions, just follow the instructions, we'll be fine. But rather, here's the problem, go out and solve it. And in order to solve that problem, you need actors and crew, and you need a team, and you need some luck, and you need money, and all those things. And uh, in this case, for me in particular, obviously as a first-time director, uh, running that set, working with crew, but most importantly, really working with these actors was the biggest, of course, the biggest challenge. Now, um, why was Logan Lerman the right guy oh to God. play this uh, this kosher butcher who doesn't want to admit he's a kosher butcher? Yeah, the son of the kosher butcher. But he did well, yes, exactly. And I mean, so many reasons. I hope you agree he was the right choice after you see the film. I just, I mean, I, I'm ecstatic, obviously, with the partnership with Logan. Um, I love the fact that he's Jewish. Uh, and I love the fact that he struggles with his own issues of spirituality and heritage. Um, and is that deeply resonant and thoughtful the young kid that you just like hanging around with? I mean, is that guy? As well as being incredibly uh, attractive and, yeah, that and vulnerable and, and, just, and sexually naive. Oh my God! And all those things. And he he really brought so much just genuine shoe leather work to this project. He worked. He prepped for six months. Um, and we walked through every aspect of this character's life. He he was reading the the textbooks that this character would have read in 1951 in those classes. We looked up the syllabi um, at Bucknell University where Philip Roth had gone the same year. And we went read through Bertrand Russell, who was the kind of the hero of the movie. Uh, All right, well, as long as you're bringing that up, we have this amazing centerpiece uh, that is a tour de force, really, uh, where, where the great Tracy Letts, who, yep. as we know, is a playwright and an actor, a formidable one, uh, and, 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 a, and someone who's very intimidating, yeah. well, whether on stage or on screen. Because it, I, I said this to Tracy, uh, yes, I said, it doesn't actually matter that you're one of the nicest people on earth. You're still just insanely intimidating. Look at the big short. You know? I know he's great. I want my money. Um, he is. He just can't help it. That's just who he is. And, uh, and yeah, that, that scene, um, which was crazy because last night at the screening, of course, uh, I guess you were there. Yes, they I, talked about how they worked on it all day. Oh, well, it was, the shoot was nuts. But actually the experience in the theater with an audience, of course, is something different. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen. And I've only had that experience once before where an audience just bursts out into applause at the end of a scene. And that was the first fight scene in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon when we screened it for the first time at Cannes. And I thought, oh, that's weird because in a way they're very similar. It's an unexpected battle. And it is true, I, looking back, but even at the time I knew it, that for a first feature to propose to your financiers and your potential distributors, like, okay, we're going to make this you know, low-budget movie, period drama, yeah. Philip Roth, and by the way, smack dab in the middle of the movie, I bring in a secondary character and I plant a 16-minute scene 
between two characters in a room, and if the scene isn't doesn't work at the absolute highest level that we can make, the whole film will just fall apart. And it'll be a disaster. The whole thing. So it was. It was I, looking back, I thought, how? Why? why did I want? But luckily, Tracy. It feels like that was the writing that you were most excited by: the dialogue, the exchange, the power dynamics between the two. There's such a narrative and isn't structure. That, I'm yeah. sorry. Isn't that part of where your title comes from? Yeah, absolutely. Indignation is. Look, it, it's. Here's a kid who's facing an America on the, on the rise of McCarthyism, a rise of xenophobia, a useless imperial war overseas that's just churning out and killing young people. It sounds nothing like America today, does it? And, and a world in which young women are being slut-shamed and marginalized, and there's a kind of weird penumbra of abuse and just something... It's just like something in the air. Uh, so even though it's 1951 and the morals are so different, I thought, wow, this is now. He really, Philip really did it again. Um, but that scene was um, was extraordinary when I was reading the novel, and I realized, wow, I could just simply. This, he's making my life very easy here. I just lift, 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 and only later did I have to go in and shape and trim and edit and really get in, into it, uh, into the weeds. But it's essentially what Philip imagined. Uh, uh, initially and put on the page. That's it. Well, Tarantino has always said that writing is, is writing and then it's directing is writing and editing is writing. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so you've discovered that as well. I have, although I have to say that, um, that for me, the, the great personal I'd say journey on this was to have the experience of working directly with actors and watching them help shape what was on the page into something ineffable. That you can't, yes, you edit it and you craft it, you sculpt it, but unless you get it, unless they bring it, there's, there's nothing you're going to be able to do with it. Right? So let's talk Sarah Gaydon. Uh, she's remarkable. I've been on to her. Yes. I'm so happy for her. You know, she's, she works her, I mean, this woman works and works and works, and it's time for the world to pay attention. It is time. If I have anything, if, I can, if I've helped her along that path, I've done my job already. And I, I love, she came in and we, the very first time we ever walked through scenes and talked, and, and she said, we did a little reading, and, and I said, and I, I remember after that, she just finished the, the scene, and I, I thought, well, there's just one little, you know, and I thought, wait a second, just, what's the least thing, what's the smallest possible thing I can say, and see what happens if she, to get her to another place. And I, I gave a note that was as tiny as, so minuscule that you could almost not notice it. And I'll never forget, she kind of heard it, she said, uh, okay, and then went again, and it was, just, it was like, okay, and I thought, oh, this is going to be, she made it so easy to direct it. It's crazy. So what are we uh, going to expect in terms of when this comes out? You know, uh, the deal it was just signed, the ink is not dry. I know it will be sometime this year. Uh, but, uh, and I know that there's interest from, obviously, you know, in terms of that kind of, you know, the prestige, appropriately uh, enough, season thing, whatever. But I'm old enough to know, and uh, zen enough to feel that, and I, this is actually what I said to the studio this morning in our meeting, that don't worry about me. Uh, this, I'm not that guy who says you have to release this during the Oscar season, uh, it, or else I'll be offended at your lack of belief, and that will uh, forget it. And I actually am a guy who has credibility with making that statement because I was sitting at the Academy Awards with a film called Brokeback Mountain, the year a film that was released in April won Best Picture. And that film was Crash, and it was distributed by a company that just bought my movie. So I don't have to lecture them. On the other hand, the guy who's in charge of that campaign is the one who's spearheading the Spotlight campaign Correct. this year for Correct. Open Road. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. <laughs> I have bona fides on that speech, which is, which is that we all forget in this business that the right time to release a, a good movie or a bad movie or any movie is the right time for that movie. It has nothing to do with the Oscar clock that is a fantasy creation of a horde of pundits, pundits and consultants and publicists. So it looks like this movie is going to go out the old-fashioned way, if I may be so bold. Exactly. And here we are at Sundance, yeah. and it's very obvious 
given who's been buying a lot of the films so far, which is Amazon, um, that the, uh, the paradigm shift that we've been observing for many years is definitely speeding up. Or we're finding a, a shape. No, I would, I would argue back on that. Okay. Yeah. I would think that right now we are in an early phase, yet to be determined where it will land, where these large corporations are willing to spend against the products on an understanding of its value as creating goodwill for their brands and market attention for their infrastructure. It has very little to do with the actual economics of independent film. So what we're seeing is... It, it may have a negative impact on the economics if it's throwing the, um, the advances um, out of whack. Yeah, I don't think so. Given though. the theatrical market. Sure. And look, so if you're stuck in the theatrical market and yeah. this other company isn't... Uh -huh. No, remember, no one's, everyone's stuck where they are. The other company is willing to spend to put you into their digital space because they want that kind of high net worth type of culture, whatever. Or they just want the associated glow of the product. Or the eyeballs subscribing. Or the eyeballs. And again, though, these are the metrics on this are quite hazy. And uh, you can tell there's a lot of pushback right now in the kind of rhetoric which trumpets a certain kind of metrics that then nobody wants to share or actually really study. And when you say X number of viewers saw it, what does that mean? Are you using an algorithm which says X number of people who press play represent X number of viewers because you decide that for each IP address there are 2.7 viewers in that household? Um, when you say they saw it, does that mean they saw five minutes of it, ten minutes of it, two and a half hours of it? What are you saying? And the point being is we've seen the same logic before back in the day when HBO entered the cable space and pay cable became its thing and the, the satisfaction of the, of, of the subscriber base was the trumpeted metric, right? We are seeing the exact same language being used now by the online giants to trumpet the insertion of the consumers into spaces where they can be tracked, digitally surveyed, understood what they're watching, what they're watching, what they're clicking on, what they're buying, in, you know, uh, within the zone that they're living in. This is the same rhetoric we've heard before, right? That the fact is that the HBOs, the world, the Showtimes, the stars turned out to be an enormous boon to the film industry for quite a long time. They bought at a premium film rights as, as an ancillary market, and it is, it is yet to be determined whether or not the screaming giants and behemoths are going to function eventually as a replacement. They seem to be competing with them well, oh, for no, original oh, for pay, series. Pay, yes, oh yes, but for TV, but I'm talking about uh, purely on film? film. As a replacement, clearly they are already functioning in many ways as a replacement for pay cable. Yes. What they will end up being in terms of replacing the, the entire matrix of the windowing from theatrical all the way to subscription video on demand, that pile of digital media out there, is yet to be determined. So always every couple of years, somebody new player comes in and throws an enormous, gigantic ass load of cash on some lucky filmmaker two, three, or four. We've seen it again and again. And then things start to settle and shape themselves, and no one knows where this is going. I guess the question really is the overall health of the art film um, specialty uh, theatrical market. Yeah, and here again, I'm old enough to have heard every this cycle. The studios are getting out of the mid-budget drama. It's the death of serious cinema. The studios, blah, blah, blah. And then look at the Best Picture nominees just this year. Not only the nominees themselves, but also the box office they're doing. Tell me about The Big Short. Now, tell me about uh, Mr. Inuritu. Tell me about... Which was an expensive movie. It was. It, it certainly was. That's really a studio. I mean, beyond studio. Yes. That's like a blockbuster film. So, I, okay, I take that back. That's like... Okay, that's a massive amount of... Uh, okay. You but could let's say talk Birdman about, from last year. Birdman from last year, exactly. That's why I said Mr. Inu Rito and I didn't say the name of this. But you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The, the, the studios, you know, Sony, Paramount, Universal, Working Title, even Disney, you name it, they've never vacated that space. Never. There's waves when there's good years and bad years. But don't give me that speech and tell me like you're telling me something I haven't heard again. Again and again over the entire record. Thank you, James.